Welcome back. Uh, we'll continue with our study of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, where um, Paul is telling uh, Timothy not to rebuke an older man. And we said this word rebuke um, is a different uh, Greek word that he uses compared to the other places where he talks about rebuke and the Greek word that he uses elsewhere in the New Testament. But the, the, the Greek word rebuke is that he uses is only found in this place and um, in this verse. And it means, you know, uh, to strike at. So he's telling uh, Timothy, don't attack older men with words, but treat them with <coughs> respect, just like you would treat a younger uh, man or his younger brother. Okay. And he's telling them, uh, telling Timothy to exhort the older men as fathers. Now, the word exhort here is basically encourage. So he's um, <clears throat> telling him, encourage them to do what needs to be done. Okay. And the word encourage or exhort here is basically the manner of uh, a coach or a trainer, you know, helping an athlete to achieve their best. So just like a coach or a trainer would uh, encourage an athlete to achieve the best, in the same manner he's saying, you know, uh, Timothy, exhort uh, uh, the fathers, uh, encourage the fathers. Then he says, <coughs> he talks about younger men as brothers, treat the younger men as partners, as friends in the work of the gospel. Um, but at the same time, don't give... Uh, uh, you know, don't differentiate between older men and younger uh, men, okay? Then he also talks about older women here, and he says, you know, treat the older women as as mothers, okay, which means treat them with um, respect, okay, and uh, treat them with uh, <coughs> honor, give them the honor that is due to their age. And how does he have to treat the younger women? How does he say treat the younger women? As sisters, yes. You know, so he's saying treat younger women as sisters. Um, and he says, you know, uh, even though you're a young person, Timothy, look at all the young women as sisters, treat them so that you can ensure that your conduct is pure and holy uh, and above reproach. Then verse 3, he says, honor with those who are really widows. Now, why does he say really widows? <laughs> why didn't he just say honor widows and period, put a full stop up that. Why does he say honor widows who are really widows? <clears throat> yes, Lubega? We can see him trying to expand what he really meant in the preceding verses. Okay. Because there are those ones who are young and it seemed that they were sexually active, yet they were their husbands had died. And there are those ones who would be married again, and there were also those ones who pretended to be widows, but they were doing other things which were contrary to the doctrine. So that's why he was like advising them, if they are that young, let them get married and raise new families because a widow without a kid and is still young seems not to be a widow. I'm sorry to use that word. Thank you. No problem. <coughs> Thank you, Rubega. Yes, that's a good uh, um, answer. Anyone else? He's talking here about, uh, you know, uh, 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 widows are typically widows in the sense in, in, in those days, you know, there were uh, one class of people who were very, uh, were especially the vulnerable class. And these were the elderly widows. And these elderly widows, you know, were usually without support from husbands or they did not have the support of their grown up children or they did not have children who were grown up. So or they had children or grown up and would not support them. And so these uh, elderly women or elderly women, you know, they did not have adequate means of support for themselves. So he's saying, 
you know, those are the real kind of widows who have no husbands, who have no children. You know, they also can't, like uh, Rubega saying, can't marry, <coughs> can't uh, raise a family again. Says these are the real widows that you really need to uh, help. Okay. Now, if you look at this passage, there are four types of widows in these um, verses. Okay. Uh, the, uh, he talks about widows who are really in need, who are really widows, and then, you know, who do not have family members to care for themselves. And then they have the second kind is widows with children and grandchildren who are in a position who are capable to take care of uh, widows in the family. And also the third kind is younger widows who he says should remarry in verses 11 to verse 15. <coughs> Uh, the second kind, uh, he talks about them in verse 4 and verse 16. And then the fourth kind of, uh, or the fourth type of widows he's mentioning in these verses are those who, widows who live for pleasure rather than the life of the, uh, life of, for God, okay, or living a life that is pleasing to God, which he talks about in verse 6. So he's mentioning four types of widow, widows here. And he says the real widows who the church really needs to take care of are those who have, you know, first they don't have husbands, but they also don't have children or grandchildren uh, who are able to look after them or in a position to look after them. Such kind of women, you know, the church's responsibility to look after them and care for their needs. Then in verses 4 to 8, uh, he talks about the believer's responsibility towards their own family. So can one of you please read verses 4 to 8, please? Uh, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayer, prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things, and these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household he has denied the faith and is worse than an a non-believer amen thank you lubega so in these verses paul is instructing timothy what must happen in the local church when it comes to taking care of widows so he says if any widow has children which means you know he's saying those who uh, should be legitimately helped by the church, should not have a family, should not, you know, should not have any children or grandchildren to assess them, to look after them. But if widows have a family to assist them, to take care of their needs, you know, uh, they're, they're in a position to take care of their needs, it's the responsibility of the family to do it. So he's saying it's the, this is the occasion for children and grandchildren to rise up to address the needs of their um, parents or the, the needs that their parents might have. And he's saying this is also good and acceptable before God. God is pleased when we as children or we as grandchildren take care of our parents, our grandparents, or those who are widowed in our uh, family. And he says, you know, widows who are older, are those who would normally give themselves to prayer and supplication because they don't have any family now. They can't, you know, marry and all of those things. So they are the ones who would give themselves to prayer and supplication. But then he says, but she who lives in pleasure, which means you know, those who should be, um, you know, uh, those should be who, widows who should be helped by the church are those who should actually live godly lives and not the ones who give in to the pleasure of uh, uh, life, not those who are, you know, wanting to marry or sexually active or, you know, having a relationship with other men, you know, but those uh, who the church should help 
uh, should be ones who are those who are living a godly life and not uh, living a life of pleasure or not giving themselves into the pleasures of this world. And he says, uh, you know, those who live for pleasure is dead while she um, lives. Okay, verse six. But he who, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. So he's saying that, you know, the life that a person lives for mere pleasure. And a, a life that a person lives for just having an easy life is not a life that is worth living. Okay. Uh, it is living death. You're actually living, but you're living death. If you're living a life for mere pleasure and for ease in life, you know, uh, living a life of death. And, um, you know, a, he, and he's saying it can be anyone, whether it's a widow or, you know, any other young person, anyone who's living like this, they're actually living a life that is dead. That means they're dead to the things of God, they're dead to the spiritual things. And there is no life of God flowing and running into them because, and, uh, you know, they would not be able to bear fruit because they are actually living for uh, pleasures and for easy life. And then he's telling Timothy, these things command. So he's saying, a, a good pastor, a good spiritual leader, a good minister, you know, as a good minister, as a good teacher, um, as a good um, uh, uh, minister of God, a spiritual overseer, you need to teach these things so that all will know what God expects of them. Okay. So he's saying, teach this so that people will know. Widows will know how they need to live. You know, people will know that they can't just live for a life of pleasure and ease. That is a life that is living dead to the things of God. And also teach them these things so that, you know, people who have um, uh, parents or, you know, widows in their family would know it's their responsibility to take care of their widows and their parents and not leave them um, uh, to the church uh, to take care of their needs. Okay. If you look at verse 7 in the Message Bible, you know, it reads like this. It says, so that they will do the right things in their extended family. So sometimes, you know, uh, 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 most often in churches, you know, pastors uh, face a lot of uh, issues that rise up with families, you know, for counseling or, you know, parents coming to them uh, talking about how the children are treating them, children are going to uh, the pastor talking about how their parents are treating them. There's a lot of discord, discord. there's a lot of strife that's happening in the family, a lot of family issues. And most of the time, you know, pastors having to deal with a lot of family issues. So it's important that, you know, you teach about all of these things come the uh, pulpit, talking about family responsibilities, talking about what the responsibility of the children are towards the parents, the parents' responsibility towards children, um, family's responsibility to the church, family, family's responsibility to the society, uh, and all of these things, even as we see all of these instructions given to us in the Word of God, but these need to be um, taught. So you can have a series of sermons on family, family issues, and the teach what scripture is talking about, what God is instructing uh, each one of us to do as members in the family, okay? <clears throat> Verse 8, he says, But if anyone does not provide for his own home, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, okay? So uh, Paul is telling Timothy, God's normal way of providing for people in need is not just through the local congregation, but it is through the family. It is the people in the family, they have to work hard, they have to provide for the needs of the family. They can't look up to the local congregation, the local church to meet their um, needs. Okay, And if somebody does not provide for their family, Paul makes a very strong statement here. He says, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, so in the strongest terms, Paul is em emphasizing here the responsibility of a man to provide for his family, okay, to do all that uh, he can do in his means to support the needs of the uh, family, okay, uh, and, the, and how 
we as uh, you know children have to take care of our parents or our grandparents or if you're married it's your responsibility to take care of your spouse of your children you know you can't just throw the responsibility on your parents or the on the grandparents to take care of them it's your responsibility and he says if you don't do this you know uh, he says you have denied your faith and you're worse than an unbeliever so very strong statement you know and i think some of us you know we don't we think our responsibility once we get married is only to take care of our wife and our children and not take care of our um, parents yes yeah, some of your parents might be well financially stable well off and so you are depending on your parents to take care of your needs You're taking care depending on your parents to provide for you and if they don't you get very upset you get very angry you know so um i think this is a very strong statement here and it's paul is writing under the inspiration of the holy spirit you know if we are not taking the responsibility of looking after our wife and our children or our husband or children or your parents you know you have denied your faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. Nothing more can be said about um, that, but it's um, something that we all need to ponder, think, and if, yes, slacking that area we're lacking, we need to ask God for forgiveness and, um, you know, do our uh, responsibility in the governmental structure that God has placed in the family, okay? We'll move on to verses 9 to 16. Before we move on to verses 9 to 16, anyone has any questions, any doubts? Anything you'd like to say? And some things you like, you disagree, you like to talk about? Yes, Lubega. Can I say that uh, that statement that is worse than an unbeliever has both spiritual and physical implication or it is inclined on the physical implication thank you it has more um what do the others think about lubega's question can we have some discussion here please anyone else would like to have a say on what lubega said whether it's just physical or spiritual implications Uh, Jeffina says it's both. Anyone else? Everyone in class or uh, it's just Ubega and Jeffina? Yes, hello, Toli, thank you. I think uh, Lubega is um, both spiritual and physical right what uh, your physical you're talking about your actions your attitudes your mindsets so who you are and how you uh, act and behave is is your um, you know your connection with god whether you have a connection or not in the spiritual sense so spiritual is translated into the uh, physical aspect in you know, your attitudes in your mindset and how you behave did that help thank you mom So sometimes when you look at uh, unbelievers, you can't expect them to be to have honesty, integrity, not to speak lies, uh, to have the fear of God in what they're doing, moral ethics, uh, you know, living out moral, uh, morally pure lives. It's because of the God they worship, you know, or you're looking for compassion, you're looking for mercy from them, and you don't receive it, and you know it's the God that they worship is uh, uh, it's no god it's a stone god and you know it's so their heart is so sto their hearts are like stone so hard-hearted and nothing goes into their minds and you know there's nothing that can morally convict them even if they're not living morally pure and holy lives okay yeah thank you for the that question anyone else Sorry for the background noise. I don't know. There's some work going on. It's too loud. Okay. 
If there are no questions or doubts, we'll move on to verses 9 to 16, where he's talking about the church's responsibility towards widows. And so he's saying, do not let a widow under 60 years or old be taken into the number. So what does he mean here is, uh, or the idea here is that if someone is under 60, then they could still support themselves or they can, you know, still get uh, married, okay? They can remarry, uh, like Ubega said, you know, and they don't have to be added to the support list of the church. The church does not need to uh, support them, but, uh, you know, they can um, support themselves by being uh, by marrying again, uh, by remarrying or getting married again. And in verses 9 uh, and verse 10, you know, Paul again elaborates on the conditions of the verses that he has already spoken about in verses 3 uh, to verse 5 concerning needy widows. So he says, um, you know, who are the widows that are really widows that the church needs to take care of? You know, they need to be at least 60 years and older uh, who have served in the church well. You know, those kind should be taken care of by the church. And uh, if there is a need, okay, if they're 60 years and older and, uh, you know, they have a need, then the church can take care of. Or if they're 60 and older and, um, you know, they have children and grandchildren who can take care of them, then there is no need for such widows to be taken care by the church, okay? And um, like we see in verse 16, he says, you know, the family is able to take care of them and the family should do so and not burden the church so that the church can help those who are literally real elderly widows above 60 who are in real need and who don't have anyone to help them, okay? And he says, furthermore, that uh, these widows who the church takes care of, you know, um, must have shown hospitality. You know, they must have shown hospitality to strangers. They should have washed the uh, disciples' feet or the saints' feet or the believers' feet, which is showing a true sign of humility and uh, serving the church. Okay, Salaturi says, I was just thinking about what widowers who are unable to take care of themselves as it's not mentioned in chapter 5. Uh, yes, that's a very good uh, thought, um, Zelotoli. So basically, why do you think uh, Paul is not mentioned about widowers here? Any thoughts? Anyone likes to say anything? Why is Paul not mentioned about widowers here? Come on, can we have some thoughts, please? Some answers, some discussion, some people talking. And this is going to be boring if you're just going to hear my voice. Any answers? Any answers? Do you think Paul is telling we should not take care of widowers? What do you think? You can at least say something. Mama, I do not hear the question. Uh, it's in the chat section, Lubega. Zelotoli's question is, she was saying, I was just thinking, what about widower who are unable to take care of themselves, as is not mentioned in chapter 5? It's a great question. A good one. Why, this, why do you think Paul is not mentioned about widowers? I 
actually to be honest mm-hmm. Anatoly, i never thought mm-hmm. about it myself <laughs> रोसलिन शेयरिंग i think yes uh, maybe um, you know men were able to you know take care of their needs work maybe you know um, also have a family that married you never know i recently read there's a man who is uh, in india somewhere in north india he is close to 100 but he's married recently you know, a year back he's married <laughs> so you know because uh, he's feeling lonely he needs somebody to take care of him married a very young uh, woman who's a widow herself uh yeah so maybe that can be the reason but um, i think even paul would have thought about widows but uh, especially uh, you know he's talking here about widows because they might need more help security in the sense protection Yes, Nubega. No I think we all know that in the old, in the old days, there was gender bias, whereby uh, inferior people in the society were taken to be children and women, and so they thought men would take good care of themselves. But just as we see where it is written in men, at times it is changed to mean women. So I think doctrine-wise, putting our modern society into context. also they should also be looked at, uh, at depending on the criteria as being portrayed there for instance if they are young they should marry again and if they if they are that old and they are not busy bodies and they are not doing wrong things they should be taken care of by the church just as uh, the widow are being taken care of i think it is in the same context thank you yes thank you lubega so i think we can look at it in that context we can you know if there are widows as well yes uh, you know they can be taken uh, care of okay yeah so we'll uh, move on you know uh, so he's qualifying here in these verses you know um, in verses um, 9 to 16 who uh, really a widow is so if you know somebody is, does not have a, a family who cannot take care of their needs but even if they are elderly widows and they have a family can take care of their needs and their family should take care of their needs and also these widows should be people who you know have uh, a sense of uh, humility uh, they should have uh, been serving in the church they should wash the feet of the saints you know show hospitality uh, they should have helped people in distress um which could refer anything you know visiting the sick helping people who are sick giving counsel um uh, comforting those who are troubled worried going through grief sorrow just being there for the believers the the people in the churches uh, you know helping them up so basically to sum up the whole thing somebody who's devoted their entire life to doing good work to serving people to ministering to um, others okay so he says if a widow meets all of these uh, qualifications then they can be uh, put added to the list of um, widows in the church whom the church can uh, take care of then of course he talks about the younger widows and he advises the younger widows to remarry you know um um uh, you know just like he th- uh, he says to the deacons in in chapter 3 verses 2 and uh, verse 12 he says you know they should be uh, uh married to one man you know and uh, they also have to have reputation of good works they should uh, be busy in you know in their family chores in building in their family responsibilities building up their children bringing up their children the ways of the lord uh okay and um uh, uh you know if she's had children she already has children uh through her uh, previous husband and she has to be involved in raising them up in the uh, faith and uh, he says you know um, here in this verses he's saying um
you know, he says uh, in verse 14, okay, um, or in verse 13 and verse 14, you know, don't be idle, wandering from house to house, you know, gossips and busybodies, uh, but, you know, take care of your family. So if you are a young widow and you still have children, then, you know, uh, bring up your uh, children, raise them up in the faith. And also, you know, it says, um, uh, you know, take care of unwanted orphans. In the Roman world, there were a lot of unwanted orphans who were all left un unattended and they were left to die. And, you know, uh, the bad people, would, the corrupt people would sometimes take them for slavery, for prostitution. So he's saying, you know, you godly women, Christian women, you know, uh, take them into your homes, care, look after them, care for them as your uh, own. And he's saying that the younger women, he encourages them to get married, set up a family, instead of wasting their time on idle um, things. Okay, and um, verse eleven, he says, "But refuse the younger widows, you know, for they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, their desire to marry." So he's saying, "Refuse younger widows" means as a general rule, you know, he says don't add them to the support list of the local church because uh, you know they can basically provide for themselves they can take care of themselves uh, you know, they can work or they can remarry and they can take care of themselves uh, now this word grow wanton uh, now the word is supposed to be derived from uh, to remove okay to remove and the rain Okay, so these two words, this word wanton means to remove and the rain. And it's a metaphor that is taken from a, a, you know, from a pampered horse. So a metaphor that is taken, it's basically, metaphor is basically a symbol or a representation, an image, a comparison, or a simile that is taken from a pampered horse whose mouth, you know, the rain has been removed from the mouth so that there is nothing to check or confine that horse. The horse is just free to uh, move, okay? Now, so he's saying that, you know, um, refuse such younger widows, uh, you know, to be taking care of the church, especially those who are grown wanton, which means, you know, there's nothing to check or confine them. They're just, you know, doing what they want, uh, living their lives how they want, in pleasure and uh, you know, doing their own things. Now, these verses uh, in verses 11 to 15 uh, basically are not very easy to interrupt, inter interpret, sorry, they're not very easy to interpret. Some understand that, you know, the older widows made some kind of pledge to the Lord and to the church to the effect that they would remain single and uh, devoted to uh, 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 the rest of their lives, they are devoted to remaining, uh, you know, to uh, serve the Lord. They've uh, devoted their the rest of their lives to just uh, ministering to people, serving the Lord. Or it can also mean if a younger widow made such pledge, um, and then, you know, suddenly they have this deep urge, deep longing to marry, or they fall in love with somebody again, then it would mean that they would go back on their pledge and, uh, you know, and then they would incur uh, condemnation, uh, critici uh, criticisms, disapproval by the church or the believers in the church. Now, Paul is not condemning uh, the natural desire of younger widows to remarry. What he's basically saying that it, it's wrong to break a pledge or a promise that you uh, make okay now others look at it at these verses very differently okay um, the words um, previous pledge you know in the verse uh, 12 are literally first faith they say it's not like a pledge in the sense of a pledge but it's their first faith so they argue some people argue that paul was addressing uh, an existing problem namely that you know these younger widows who were put on the support of the church were allowing their desire to remarry um, to be greater than their faith in christ which means uh, their desire to remarry is greater in the sense that you know they're willing to go against their faith or marry an unbeliever or marry somebody who's not in the faith um, 
you know, and uh, hence they're going back on their first love or you know, their, their faith in, in Christ Jesus. Okay. So he's saying that, uh, you know, some people say it could mean that the words uh, previous pledge literally means their first faith. And so Paul was uh, addressing the problem that existed. And it could be this, you know, the younger widows, uh, 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 you know, made a pledge that they, uh, their faith in Christ Jesus. And then, you know, they have this desire to remarry. They fall in love with a man who is not a believer, who is willing to accept them, who is willing to take care of their needs, care for them. And they're willing to go away, uh, leaving their uh, faith. So all of these various interpretations um, that are there. So it's not very easy to interpret verses 11 to uh, 15. Okay. And furthermore, he says, you know, uh, when they do this, uh, they fall into the errors of false uh, teachers. Okay. And, um, you know, thus he's saying these kind of women can fall away from their first faith in uh, Christ. Okay. So these women can also fall in love and marry somebody who's, you know, in the church, but who's teaching false teachers, uh, teachings and doctrine, and hence they're going away from uh, Christ. And hence they would also be promoting false teaching. Um, and also they would be marrying based on, based on sensual desires and not marrying in the Lord. Okay. So thus Paul is instructing that they, you know, uh, they should not be supported. These younger widows should not be supported. But, you know, he's rather encouraging them to marry and devote themselves to home duties, you know, so that they don't give the enemy an occasion. They don't give the enemy a foothold in their lives. And there is uh, hence no occasion for reproach. Okay. There is no occasion for them to you know, uh, be scolded or reprimanded by the church elders. So this is the whole explanation or meaning. We can look at it in diverse uh, ways um, and we can't really pinpoint what is the real thing that he really meant or is saying here. Okay. So that is what he talks about widows, about older widows and about younger widows and who should be enlisted. Uh, what are the qualifications to enlist widows in the list of church, in the uh, local congregation of those who need to be taken care by the church? Okay. Before we move on uh, to how to treat elders, uh, how Timothy needs to treat elders, how to lead spiritual elders, which he talks about in verses 17 to 20. Anyone has any questions, doubts? Any questions, any doubts? Look at verse 16. If any, any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. Okay. So in our present day context, you know, some of us can take our parents and literally dump them in old age homes that are, um, uh, uh, you know, supported by our church, you know, and that really breaks the heart of uh, our parents or our grandparents. Okay. It really breaks their heart. I know from my own family experience, uh, two, um, two people in our family who we lost. One is my grandmother. Of course, my uncle was very, very patient to care of my grandmother, you know, uh, for uh, till she was 95 or 98 years. But it came to a time when she was not able to, of course, even in her 80s, a little past 80s, she was not able to see well. And she was not able to know where is the bedroom, where is the restroom, where is the hall, where is the kitchen. So sometimes she could mess up in the hall, bedroom, thinking that it's the restroom. And it was very difficult because when all of them came back from, the, from work, the whole place was messed up. And so when she was, I think, close to 98 or something, 
my grand my uncle decided to move her to an old age home and my grandmother did not even last for a month uh, she passed away because she was so used to staying uh, with um, family with children and so that was very sad and another sad thing was my uncle my dad's uh, older brother who had cancer and um, you know um, uh, my cousins he was you know who were staying in the home you know my cousin brother and cousin sister was basically widowed had staying with the son they all go out to work and there was no one to take care of him provide for his needs and all of those things so they decided they thought of moving him to a home which he was totally against but they they spoke him into it and um, you know so the day before in the morning you know they were going to move him to a home where they would take care of his needs well the night before he um, my cousin brother was sleeping next to him and uh, he kept on saying what's the time now and uh, my cousin brother would say it's it's 1 a.m or 2 a.m or 3 a.m and he would say okay there is so many hours left for me to move to the old age home and uh, you know, I think around four, between four, four to five, he stopped asking how many hours are left or what is the time. And then when um, my cousin brother thought maybe he's fallen asleep, good, let him sleep. Uh, but he uh, actually passed away in his sleep, okay, before they could even move him to uh, the old age home. So uh, looking at this, it's, it's, it's really so... Uh, it's so important, you know, because um, what Paul is saying uh, here in uh, this verse 16, you know, if you can take care of your, you know, older people, don't burden the church, don't burden the old age homes, take care of them. I know it's a huge responsibility and it's not easy. It requires a lot of commitment and all of those things. But um, for us, we might think of it in a different way but for them it is so hard uh, uh, breaking okay any any thoughts anyone likes to say anything or we can move on to verses 17 to 20 okay uh, we'll move on to verse 17 to 20 can somebody read verse 17 to 20 please Anyone likes to read 17 to 20, chapter 5? Or all of you left the class? <laughs> Somebody read verses 17 to 20. Go ahead, Jeffrey. First Timothy, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Let the elders who um, rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, those who are sending rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. Amen. Thank you, um, Jafina. Now, Paul is, is instructing on how to lead spiritual leaders. Uh, again, he's continuing from what he's spoken of in chapter 3. Uh, and, you know, he's talking about elders there. Now, there he's talking about elders. The Greek word is presbyteros for uh, elders. So in the early church, the terms bishop, elders, presbyters, they were all used uh, interchangeably, you know, uh, and can be um, referred one to another. It basically meaning those who are bishops, elders, you know, uh, leaders, all of them are basically those who are providing spiritual leadership in the uh, local congregation or in the church. Okay. Now he's focusing on the elders here. Okay. And he's saying the elders who rule and he's talking about the elders who teach. Okay. Those who teach are those who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay. So it's not necessary that, you know, um, every elder who rules uh, will also be an elder who teaches. They can be elders who are elders in terms of administrative authorities, and they can be also elders or those who are spiritual leadership 
basically talk about elders, talking about those who are giving spiritual leadership. They can also be ones who are uh, just teaching the word of um, God. Okay, and he says uh, those who are elders should be counted worthy of double honor. Okay, so if an elder, such as a pastor, you know, um, uh, you know, he rules well and he labors in the word and doctrine, he's preaching the word and teaching the word and doctrine, you know, uh, which means he's you know, clearly showing, working hard for the kingdom of God, working hard towards the spiritual growth of the church. He's saying such a kind of an elder, such a kind of a spiritual leader, whether he's a deacon, a bishop, an elder, you know, he is worthy of double honor. Okay, he's worthy of double honor. Now, the Greek word translated honor, you know, uh, has a double meaning. First, uh, you know, I'm not talking about double honor here, but I'm just talking about the word honor. The word honor itself in the Greek has two different kind of meanings. It has a double meaning. The first meaning is it has an idea of a price, you know, a price paid or received. And from there, uh, it came to refer to honor or esteem attached to uh, it. Okay, something that we or someone we give due value for what they are doing okay so this word honor basically in the greek means both material support and esteem because in the greek the, the first idea is of a price paid or received so you're paying a price to somebody who's a pastor an elder a teacher a spiritual leader you're giving sorry you're giving them a, 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 a amount you're paying them for their services and they're receiving it okay and from there came uh, the other meaning for the word honor, which means esteem, okay? The esteem that is attached for something or someone because of their value, of their service or what they are uh, doing. So it can, the word honor can refer both to material support and to esteem, okay? Now, when he's saying give double honor, it implies that, you know, of course, he's spoken about and says in the church, we have to honor everybody. Honor older men, honor uh, uh, younger men, older, honor older women, honor younger women. Uh, you know, uh, we have to honor everyone who are saints or believers in the body of Christ. But here he's saying that, you know, uh, those who are in spiritual leadership, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, their spiritual leadership in the terms of giving uh, administrative duty, just ruling uh, or whether they're ruling and teaching, you know, teaching the word and doctrine, such kind of people, you know, we they deserve double honor. That means they deserve greater respect and regard, okay? So we can look at it in our context today, those who are in spiritual leadership in the church, you know, yes, sometimes it's difficult for us to honor leaders who are not living lives that are honoring and pleasing in God's sight, but the Bible teaches us that we need to honor them okay just like david uh, honored uh, saul he said how can i kill the anointed of uh, god you know um, and jesus himself you know uh, respected authority he, had, he says you have to pay taxes to the government okay he honored the father um, he honored the spiritual leaders uh, or the religious leaders in one sense okay so uh, you know, we need to give greater respect and regard to those who are uh, in spiritual leadership and, uh, you know, they deserve double honor. Verse 18 says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worth his wages. Okay. Now, it's, um, Paul is saying, for the scripture says, means the principle that those who serve God's people should be paid uh, when possible, of course. Uh, and is, you know, supported by, he supports this by quoting Old Testament scripture. Uh, Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 and also Luke chapter 10 verse uh, 7. Okay. Uh, so he quotes both of these scripture passages. Um, in Luke chapter 10 verse um, 7, it says, um, we'll read this and then close 
uh, remain, he says, you know, uh, so the laborer is worth is his wages. Okay, so he's saying do not go from house to house, but the laborer is worth his wages. Okay, and he's quoting this, do not uh, muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Uh, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, and the laborer is worth his wages is in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll continue looking at verses 19 to 25 in the next class. Anyone has any questions, doubts? Any questions or doubts? Okay, if there are no questions or doubts, thank you all for uh, joining class. And I'll see you um, on Tuesday for our uh, children's ministry class. I think the children's ministry class, we have greater uh, participation and uh, you know, there is uh, uh, so much of um, uh, people talking and sharing. It's nicer. But in TTP, I don't know why it's uh, everyone is so quiet. Okay. I look forward for more participation. The TTP classes will be nice be engaging, just like Zelotoli asked me a question which I really never thought of in all these years. And all these years as I thought TTP, nobody's even asked me this question. So good, Zelotoli. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your inputs. Uh, and have a blessed weekend. God bless you. Thank you.